Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Archaeologists in Quarantine. Today we're joined with special guest Stefan Milo, who is a popular YouTuber with 84.7 thousand subscribers. Today I saw that, yeah. Um, he focuses on archaeology, anthropology and human evolution. Hey Stefan, how are you doing? Good, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Is this your first live stream? Uh, not my first, no. I haven't done one in probably a year, though. I had to tidy up the office quickly before uh, I went live. I'm pretty <laughs> sure there's nothing in the background. That's a great uh, picture in the background. I recognize that from your thumbnails. Yeah, they're uh, by Ettore Mazza, mm. best artist in the game. They're actually sound panels. I wanted to soundproof this room a little bit, so I custom printed the artwork and then put the uh, audio foam behind them and hung them on the wall. Just That's so actually they, really cool. Yeah. Does the sound work though? Does it actually work? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it works. But <laughs> I feel like you need like loads yeah. of panels for it to work. Yeah. Well, there is there is more panels behind the computer that you can't see. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's why I got a different microphone. It didn't work as well as I had hoped. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of microphones. I think we should just get straight to it first. Probably what our viewers want to know the most, the spoon. Yeah, the, the iconic. <laughs> the iconic spoon. spoon. Which has received a major upgrade. Ooh, fancy. Um, yeah, I do. It is a quirk of my production that I um, attach a microphone to a spoon. And that basically all started, it first started in an interview and I only owned one microphone. So I had to pass this lav mic between myself and the interviewee. So I just clipped it to a fork, I think, is the original utensil of choice. Um, but then as I was recording another video, the lav mic was rubbing on the coat and I had to re-record the video because my movement had just ruined the audio. And I thought maybe it'd be easier if I just hold on to the lav mic again. And so I clipped it to a spoon and uh, the rest is history. Now, if I am not holding that spoon in some way, my audience is not too happy about it. But it's the same spoon every time. It's a, I mean, it's how has that spoon survived? I mean, it's a plastic spoon. I mean, I just wheel it out for the uh, for the videos. I'm not eating with it during the week. You know, it just stays attached to the microphone. So I can imagine you're coming out with like a hundred years. A hundred years. Well, I mean, it's plastic. So, yeah, I can just yeah, have yeah, this yeah. image of you like rolling out this massive suitcase, opening it up full of like foam padding. And then you just see like this pristine plastic spoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if there's ever a museum for archaeology YouTubers, you need That's to donate right. that spoon. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if I was ever so lucky to uh, hit something crazy, like a million subscribers, I feel like I might auction it off or something. I don't know. Maybe not even for charity, maybe just to make a stupid amount of money for myself. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I would like to see that happen now. So if you're not already subscribed to Stefan, his details are in the description below. And let's try to get him up to 85,000. Let's try and do that at least. Round it off yeah. a little bit. Or why not get 100k? <laughs> okay, so how did your journey start with creating your YouTube channel? Because as I said, you have 84.7 thousand subscribers in the space of what, two years? Yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah, two and a half years, something like that. Um, I don't know, really. I've been playing around with YouTube for six years really this Stefan Milo channel is not my first and um, I really had several uh, failed YouTube channels where I learned a lot but I guess they were failures in the sense that I don't uh, make anything on them anymore but I did learn a lot and I did have fun and I sort of caught the video making bug and I thought I might as well um talk about what I'm actually interested in, which is archaeology, which is what my degree was in. Shout out to Sheffield Archaeology Department. And um, it just took off, really. I think 
uh, one thing that helped was that when I started, not a lot of people were talking about prehistory. I mean, even I wasn't talking about prehistory. My first video was about George Washington's childhood. Which um, I remember. I actually yeah, remember that video, yeah. And I was just walking through a park, talking to the camera. And I had the notes like sellotape to the camera because I couldn't remember what to say. And, um, but then I think it really took off when I started talking about prehistory, which is what I did study at university anyway and what I'm interested in. And I think I just hit a, a niche that not a lot of people were talking about and uh, it took off. Yeah. Mm. I'm trying to think. Yeah. I remember because I remember seeing the video of you walking in the park talking about, yeah, George, good old George Washington. Very yeah, interesting yeah. video, I must admit, because um, I never actually thought of it in that way before. Just the stuff that you were saying. I don't think many people um, even know that or want to acknowledge it actually, is maybe the, the key bit there, acknowledgement. Yeah, maybe. I mean, he's a pretty uh, iconic chap here in America, which is why I made it. I live in America for my... Don't let the accent fool you. I'm, I'm over here in America, but... Um, oh, hello to our viewers at home. Thank you for the comments. If you have any questions for Stefan, please write them in the chat box and we will try to answer them all, depending on what it is, science. <laughs> so... In regards to, ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, good point, thanks guys. Um, what was I gonna say? With your videos of like now, if we compare both of them and you actually look in your description box, we can see that you actually write the sources of your video, like where you get your information from, which I think is quite important and not many people realize what that actually means. How much work goes into creating your videos? A lot of work, really. A lot of work. I mean, it depends on the topic and on how ambitious I'm feeling, but adding the uh, sources was really important to me because I'm not an expert on any particular subject. And it's sort of like if you're making a video about history, the first step on making a good video about history is that you're talking about it accurately. Um, it's not all the editing and animations and all of that stuff is, is fantastic too. But if the fundamental point that you're talking about is wrong, then it, it's a terrible video. So I always put the sources in to um, ensure that I'm confident in what I'm talking about, that anyone who's watching can look into what I'm saying for themselves, critique it, question it. And I think it holds the videos to a higher academic standard. Um, but, but it does mean that there's a, a lot of work going into them. Sometimes I'm researching a video for uh, several months before I decide to, uh, that I'm confident in the topic enough to make it. And there are many videos that I've thought about making and uh, didn't because I was not confident enough in the research. Um, and, and even now I'm working, now that the channel is more successful, I actually get writing help from people who actually know what they're talking about. Specifically, Amanda Rossio, who's a great science communicator. You should definitely have her on. Um, but hopefully more in the future too, just to keep that quality high um, and keep the information accurate. That's the thing. It's so important to, to understand that there are many opinions um, and interpretations about scientific analysis. And it's to show that, which is the important part. So I think it's great what you're doing and the fact that people can actually see that you are sourcing it. You're not making it up. And when it is your opinion, you're saying, you know, you're, you're stressing that this is more so your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely try to and always acknowledge the fact that I could be wrong about <laughs> almost anything really but the sources I think is is key and it's not done a ton on YouTube um I think it definitely could be done more to uh, to keep the standard high but um but yeah I think it's really really important hmm. we have a, a really great question um from Angelina thank you Angelina and hello um, this is regarding a somewhat recent uh, 
a conversation, shall we say, or disagreement that happened on Instagram between you and a Life in Ruins podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she's asking, how did the fight between you and them start? Why did they challenge each other? Which period is better, Chalithic against Neolithic? <laughs> oh, man, the Chalcolithic versus the Neolithic. They're brothers in arms. I can't possibly, can't possibly pick a favorite between those two. But no, uh, the Neolithic is, is my personal favorite time period. I do talk about it quite a bit on the channel. And I, and I was sick of all these Paleolithic memes blaming everything wrong with the modern world on the poor, hapless Neolithic. And uh, so I just, I just decided to call them out one day and, and a life in ruins, those jokers, those clowns, they're big perpetuators of these Paleolithic memes. So, so they were uh, my number one target, but it was all uh, just a bit of fun for anyone watching. This was not a serious <laughs> beef or, or issue, but I just wanted to, I, would, I made some like a fake motivational posts, but you know, centered them on Neolithic topics. Like uh, I can't even remember any of them now. But it, I think it was like, don't, one was like, don't think about what could go wrong. Just start cultivating potatoes at different <laughs> elevations and stuff. Just like fake uh, motivational posts, the kind you see on Instagram all the time. But yeah, it just came about out of my uh, frustration at seeing one too many Paleolithic memes, really. And I won. Definitely the Neolithic is better. They, they had no comeback, in my opinion. I hope that answered your question, Angelina, and that was a great one. Because I actually forgot about that until I read the comment. I actually forgot that that happened. That was the funniest yeah. and most bizarre week, I think, on my Instagram feed. It was about a week, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Just went on and on. <laughs> yeah, I did prepare a post for like um, one post every day for a week. And then I got like so excited after I posted the first one that I did them all in like two days, I think, in like a death or glory. <laughs> <laughs> like spree. it was brilliant for anyone i think you can still catch some of it over on instagram again the links are in the description below yeah. um, we have another question from the histocrat thank you for your question what is your process for finding new topics to cover just stuff coming up when reading about your own interests yeah basically so the histocrat is another fantastic youtube channel so you guys should check that out He uh, It's been a big supporter of mine. So shout out to him. Uh, and you can't steal these ideas, Charles, but I'll let you in on a secret. <laughs> so it basically does just come from reading a lot um, through, I mean, I sort of know a lot of topics that would be popular topics that I want to cover. So in January, I've got a video coming out about Homo erectus. I even got the skull sitting next to me. Nice. Um, because I just feel like there's a lot of videos about human evolution and they all tend to talk about Australopithecines or Neanderthals. No one talks about what goes on in the middle. So if I feel like there's a gap that I could uh, exploit, I will. And, um, but for example, I was reading a book. I can't rem ex remember the name of it, the white ship or something. It's a new book about a ship that sunk in the 1120, I think, and killed Henry the first child. It's about medieval history. And in it, they mentioned a law book that survived from 12th century England. And I was like, oh, that would be really interesting to actually see the laws. And so I got that book. And then through that book, I realized that there's other uh, legal books that have survived from the medieval periods from Italy and from medieval China. So I'm going to try and uh, recreate some court cases from the medieval world on my channel coming up. And I think that would be interesting. I haven't seen anyone do anything like that. So don't steal the idea, Charles, or anyone else watching. I'm already halfway through the research, so I'll beat you to it. So don't even try. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but just stuff like that, stuff that takes my fancy, stuff that I feel like uh, hasn't been done. 
I've got all sorts of random history books. Like uh, history and archaeology books. This is something I might do in the future. Ooh. The traffic systems of Pompeii. How did the Romans organize their streets? And hmm. it sounds really boring. So I might have to title it like Roman traffic systems. It's not boring or <laughs> something like that. Or not boring video on the Roman Empire. I don't know. But just through reading a lot, really, is reading a lot, seeing what other people are doing and, and trying to do something different. Mm. And that's the thing, like, um, we noticed recently they did a collaboration with David in Howe on the domestication of dogs. And it just goes to show that even then we can, you know, and I actually interviewed him, uh, I think last week, two weeks ago, I've forgotten already, very recently <laughs> I interviewed David. Yeah. And um, coincidentally, actually, at the same time, I kind of love it. I think it was even better that way. Yeah, I yeah. benefited, so thank you. I got subscribers from that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it's great that you're, like, doing some collaborations now as well. And I noticed recently that you did a interview with some history YouTubers where you were putting them against the audience. Yeah, including the histocrat who just asked that question. Yeah. Um, Trying to get you back, maybe. <laughs> maybe, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I sort of, uh, one of the big uh, YouTube channels, another way I find ideas and find um, sort of how to make my channel, how to make my videos, is to try and see what people outside of the world of history and archaeology are doing. And I suppose copy them or at least, uh, you know, be influenced by them. And one big influence on me is uh, Tom Scott, a fantastic YouTuber, uh, maybe one of the biggest British YouTubers, mm. uh, I'm sure. He's pretty big. He is pretty big, yeah, well over a million subscribers. Mm. And manages to release a video every Monday. I don't know how he does it. That is really impressive. But um, he does a lot of quizzes, and I thought it would be fun to uh, do the same. It wasn't as popular as I had hoped, um, but I do have a whole idea for a series of quizzes that I might put on my second channel because I'm trying to, to grow that at the minute, which is a uh, Stefan Milo Savlovich. You can just, it's just my full name rather than my abbreviated name and you can find it on the, my channel if anyone wants to check it out. But I'm trying to grow that and I might put a archeology span and history themed quizzes on there, yeah. Sounds like fun. Um... A couple of other ones. Let's see what's coming through. Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, it was uh, One Ship Sinking Le Leads Two Decades of War. Is that the name of the book? Maybe. It was yeah. by Charles uh, Spencer, Princess Diana's brother. Oh. Um, but it's a great book. It's a great book. And oftentimes um, I'm reading, you know, I spend a lot of time reading about prehistory for my channel. So when I'm not uh, just relaxing, I try to read anything but that and just try and keep my mind open to uh, what would be a good idea and stuff. Hmm. Well, like we've got people trying to absorb all the good ideas that everyone's ever had and, and turn them into YouTube videos. It's hard work though. I don't think people realize how hard it is to first of all, think of the idea, then research it, script it if you need to script it, then shoot it, then edit it. We actually had a question from a viewer earlier asking what video editing software you use. I'm all, I use all the uh, Adobe software, Premiere yeah. Pro and After Effects. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's time consuming for every, sometimes I can really, crack the whip and get some work done but most of the time I work very slowly and you know for every minute of video that's probably an hour to an hour and a half of editing so if a video is 20 minutes that's really going to take me basically all week at the, at the pace I work just to edit it this is the thing I think people are so fast to criticize uh, but they don't understand how much work goes into like every single element of creating something um, until you try yeah. it yourself. Yeah, I mean, now I'm fortunately because of the success of my videos, I've been able to quit my job in the last three months and now I do this full time. But 
before this three month period, you know, 20 hours of editing is, is working all weekend. And, um, you know, I had, I did that for two years basically to get my channel off the ground. So it is a lot of work, but, uh, it's totally worth it. I mean, now I get to pursue a career in the subject that I'm interested in. Uh, so it was totally worth it in the end, but it does take a while. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Ah, okay. Um, this is from Andre. Thank you, Andre. Any hope for a video or two about Neolithic cultures in the South Central Europe from Lepensky, Vir to Vin Vinca? Vincia? Vinca, Vincia mm. yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. I do hope to uh, cover both of those. My, um, I did have, I did cover Lepensky Veer briefly in my video, What Happened to the Hunter Gatherers of South Eastern Europe. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, but my, my problem is I like to keep it interesting for me personally. I like to jump around the topics quite a lot. Um, I'm, a, I'm just amazed by the history podcasts that can cover like every year of history, day after day, week after week, and, and not get bored about talking about that subject. <laughs> I don't understand how they do it. So I, do, I jump around quite a lot, but uh, rest assured, there's plenty more videos on the Neolithic Europe to come, plenty more. Brilliant. Um, what's your favorite archaic human? Favorite archaic human? Um, it's hard not to say the Neanderthals because they're so similar to us. And outside of us, they may be the most successful, so we know more about them. But I have been. I've been really digging, researching Homo erectus. These guys do not get the credit they deserve. They really were globe traveling, um, producing all sorts. I got even got an Acheulean hand axe here next to me, Ooh. producing all sorts of uh, pretty sophisticated tools compared to anything that came before. And in my opinion, they were like the first hominin that if we looked at them and, and saw them today, we would call them human. I think we would, you know, not hesitate to call them human. And Australopithecine, I don't know if we would see them and, and think of them as humans, but I think if we saw Homo erectus, a family of Homo erectuses, <laughs> I was going to say Homo erecti, but I'm sure that's not the plural. <laughs> Homo I'm not erectus. sure, to be honest. It's been a while since I studied uh, human evolution. Uh, I'm definitely that's definitely not the plural but uh um but I'm sure if we saw them interacting we would think of them as human so they're they're really interesting they're currently what I'm reading about the most mm, well I mean I guess it'll be quite interesting for the viewers at home then to watch your video in the new year yeah coming out probably towards the end of January okay and uh I'm gonna try hard to make it as good as possible I got the replica fossils the tools so it should be a good one yeah for our viewers at home that skull if, if i can tell from the label actually it's one of those uh, museum grade replicas yeah i've seen a few of those actually in my time i can just tell from the label yeah it's pretty this one is sangaran uh 17 1 to 1.7 million years ago and it was found in java indonesia which is the interesting thing about Homo erectus. You know, they didn't just uh, stick to Africa. They spread almost as far as Australia, as far as Southeast Asia and uh, pretty much everywhere in between. So that's pretty incredible. Mm. And um, in regards to that, we had a couple of questions. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Ah, okay, back to Neanderthals. Um, is it common scientific theory that Neanderthals did not die out and eventually crossed with archaic humans and thus their DNA lives on in us, if you can answer that. Well, some definitely did. 
because we do have a very small percentage of Neanderthal DNA in us. I think less than 2% mm. of, of Neanderthal DNA. So some uh, clearly joined human groups or at some point humans and Neanderthals met, produced a child and that child was successful enough in its community to pass on its genes. Um, whether we could say that all Neanderthals did that, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert. I think it's probably unlikely considering how little Neanderthal DNA we have in us that mm. that happened. Um, and, you know, over the course of humans and Neanderthals interacting over tens of thousands of years, every scenario you could imagine probably happened at some point. Sometimes the groups joined, sometimes they fought. Sometimes they just out competed each other in some way, you know, over the course of such a huge span of time, it's easy to uh, forget how large these spans of times were. Uh, every scenario that you could possibly imagine probably happened at some point. So that's my non-expert opinion in the matter. Well, thank you for that. I think that answers the question. In your opinion, though, why do you think people are so fixated with Neanderthals the most compared to the others? Why do you think it's know. always this one? I mean, in terms of archaeology, I can see why someone as an archaeologist, as an anthropologist, would want to study them because they were so much more numerous and successful than other hominin species. There's just a lot more to study and a lot more to excavate. So I can, from that perspective, I can see why someone would want to study Neanderthals, but the general public has really taken a shine to them. Um, and I think on, on the one hand, I think some people like it because it makes you, if you have more Neanderthal DNA than, than average, it's like a small, I don't know, a small thing that might make you unique. I think people like to be unique. And if you are 2.1% Neanderthal instead of 1.8, then that's, a, that's an interesting thing, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think as well, because we've known about Neanderthals for a long time, uh, you know, since the middle of the 19th century, that they've had a long time to seep into public consciousness. And we sort of really unfairly labeled them as just a brutish cavemen up until really recently. And now modern archeology span is uh, showing that they had a lot more going on. Had, they were a lot more sophisticated than we thought. And, and they were so sophisticated that they were able to have children with us and you know, those children were able to fit in with our communities and successfully reproduce and all of that. So, so I think we, we did them unfairly and, and people like, people like an underdog, <laughs> I don't, but I don't know, really, I don't know. It is interesting how they've captured the public imagination. Mm, you're right in that sense. Well, this is a great suggestion from Sammy. Thank you, Sammy. How about doing a three to four minute book review of each new book you consume, raw and uncut, simple content for your main or second channel to give some sort of pep talk into more people checking sources? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have thought about that. Add to your list. That. Yeah. I have, yeah, I know, a list of things <laughs> to do. I've thought about that, about um, when I release a video on the main channel, like, uh, say, Homo erectus. On the, on the second channel, picking one of the sources that was used to make that video and just talk about it in more detail. But um, yeah, I have, uh, yeah, there's lots of really interesting books on my shelf that I could, I could review for sure. I'm, I'm thinking of something along those lines. Yeah, don't worry, Sammy. I'll think of something like that. But it'll I mean, be on the B channel for sure. Yeah, it'll be good on the second channel. Even Mr. Kratt agrees. <laughs> Second channel. I think everyone will be agreeing with that. That that will be quite cool. Yeah. Because it's like the thought behind, you know, behind the madness, how you create something is what you're thinking as you're as you're going through it all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for sure. Another great question. Thank you, Alex. Why archaeology? 
How did you find yourself in the archaeological and historical discipline? Uh, I've always loved history. Um, ever since I was a small kid, all I did was the only thing I would draw when I was a kid was castles. That's like the only thing I was interested in drawing and I would draw them historically accurately. No, no fancy additions on my castles. These were, these were <laughs> accurate depictions of, of a medieval castle. Do you, do you actually have any of these masterpieces? No, I don't think so. But my artistic ability has not improved in any way. So <laughs> I could bosh one out quickly, but, um, and when I was uh, 16, 17 and looking for what to do at uni university, I thought about doing history, but then I thought if I did archaeology, I could spend more time camping and drinking beer with my friends. And that seems like a really facetious and silly reason to pick a topic, but that is basically it. I thought I would be able to continue studying history. And, and then another passion of mine is camping. And then so that would combine those two interests. And um, I thought for sure that I would study the Roman Empire and medieval history, which is what I had been reading a lot of up until that point. And then in my first year of university, when you do the introductory classes and you learn a bit of everything, the classes on prehistory and human evolution absolutely blew my mind. And, uh, and the rest is history, really. That started the obsession. I like that. Uh, guys, please get your questions in. We're coming out towards the end. Uh, let's go. Do, do, do. Let's see. We'll, we'll take another three questions. Let's go with that. Lucky right. number three. Okay. Uh, this one's a nice question from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Which of your videos is your favorite or the one you're most proud of? Oh, man, that's so hard mm. to say because it's hard not to cringe when you watch your own videos. It really is. Yeah. And I'm noticing um, like things about editing that the ordinary viewer might not not notice. Um, but ones that I really liked, I did like the one when I talked about Neolithic Italy and the underwater site there. I thought that was really interesting one. And then my last video on the life of a Carthaginian merchant, I really like that from a, an editing standpoint. And this sounds silly perhaps, but it's really hard to edit a video, especially when you have no background in it. And in this one, when it was sort of a happier part of the video, the music was upbeat and happy. And when it was sad, the music was slower and, and more low tempo. And so I really think that that was edited well that's like all i focus on is improving the quality of the videos so my favorite video is one that is just like from what i see as the best edited so the the my earlier videos even though i love them in a way i sort of hate to watch them back <laughs> not the one with you having a slice of pizza <laughs> no no i mean that is sort of like now I try and find a gimmick that's like related to the storytelling, but the slice of pizza has nothing to do with Neanderthals. So it's like, why did I do that? You know, I really try it. Like, I'm so critical of my own work. It's so hard. Well, this is the thing, look, you're growing, you're changing your style. It's continuously, that's, that's what people see. And I think that's kind of the beauty of YouTube in the sense of, especially for YouTubers, you can see how they grow and how they yeah. start to focus on one thing. And I really like that, even for my personal, like doing archaeologists in quarantine from beginning of, I can't remember when I started. I think it was like maybe April. I think I yeah. started, I don't remember. But the point is I've changed so much over that time. Um, and that's just the beauty of, of continuously working on our craft. Um, okay, there's a couple of more questions. I'll try to be fast. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see, where did it go? This one's quite nice, um, from Histocrats. Which of your earlier videos would you like to remake now that your video editing skills are OP? I don't know what OP means. What does OP mean? Original, overpowered, no. I think. Overpowered? Overpowered. Well, now, that they're, now that they're better? 
now that they're better yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh i was thought about that i think i would remake um why i would probably the video i think i called it why did neanderthals go extinct and i think i'd even change the title i'd probably change it to why did homo sapiens replace neanderthals and i would uh yeah maybe have another crack at that one it's not only does like the video making improve but the research also improves and, and i think i could have another go at it I mean, i'm really thinking of remaking that one like in I a nutshell, about that this morning. what is what is the, the what is the answer to that in a nutshell uh, and then for them to re, for them to then watch it <laughs> it's hard i mean there's there's loads of reasons why it might have happened uh climate change the at the time that we replaced them the climate was uh undergoing a severe cold shock which wasn't great there was a big volcanic eruption at the same time um there's evidence that humans were better able to maintain a stable and consistent diet like from analyzing our teeth we can see that even in times of hardship better times our diet is very stable and neanderthals really fluctuated so that shows that they might have been struggling to adapt or and then you know we were shagging them too so they were joining us along the road and <laughs> So it's complicated. There's, there's not, there's definitely not one answer to that question. That's science in itself, isn't it? It's continuously like evolving the information yeah. that we find, and that's why archaeology in itself is so important. When people always ask me, "Why do I do archaeology? What's the point of it? It's been in the ground for X amount of years. There's no need to know more." Well, we need to look at it to understand what was going on, and it's the material culture, yeah. from my point of view. That's such a boring attitude. We've got to do something to keep ourselves occupied. That's true. And yeah. <laughs> until we die you know i mean i do love what it do you want to doing with their life just sitting staring at paint come on they've got to do something that interests them i mean it's true it is there is there's nothing that beats when you find something after like excavating for hours or days or weeks and finding nothing nothing yeah. and then you pick up something you're like oh my gosh like you know yeah, i can see your that's i didn't notice that wall of artifacts there i see a, a bowl of pipes to. I know, that's a very oh yeah, my little pipes. Let me show you my pipes. I feel like it's a bit of a show and tell. I'll do a show and tell for you quickly. Oh, without moving. Yeah, these are my beautiful little pipes. So have you ever thing... attempted to reuse any of them out of curiosity? No. No, I don't smoke. What would I put in there? I could just put normal grass, I guess. Normal, like from the garden. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just the park. I don't know. Some flowers. But yeah, so for people at home, um, the the size of the bowl is how you, we know how old something is. So we can tell you when it was made. So the shape changes over time and they start from, I think, 1580 to 18, 1860 is actually very late 19th century. We see them being used. They come in and out of use, fashion, the price of tobacco, which is also why the shape of the bowls. So lots of random different things, but the best thing is the motives that you get on it. Slightly off point. I have none here now for you. These are just like the boring ones that we wouldn't keep at work. So this one, you can kind of see the detailing on it. I don't know if you can see that right there. Yeah. There's something. This is what we get excited over. This is what, this is what archaeologists get excited over. Little, little things, as you can see, I haven't even cleaned it because mud's coming out of it. Still mud. <laughs> Archaeological context right there for yeah. you who will analyze that bit um but yeah <laughs> right last few questions let's see do, 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 do. what we haven't asked oh i like this one caden um i know the answer to the first bit but i'll ask anyway have you done a video on the domestication of the horse i know it happened independently in at least three different places uh i haven't I haven't. I, that's one that is on the list of possible topics. I have a lot of books on my shelves about that. Uh, I know a very popular one is this one, The Horse, the Wheel and the Language, about a Bronze Age Eurasia and the domestication. And that definitely touches on the domestication of horses. I didn't, I didn't know that it happened in three locations, though. I definitely can't uh, fact check that, but 
yeah, that sort of uh, early Bronze Age Central Eurasia uh, is definitely high on my list of topics, maybe for 2021. The problem is, again, I get distracted by the shiniest new thing. You know, I bought those books a year ago to make a video, but I just keep reading and then keep thinking, oh, you know, this would make a good video, that would make a good video, but at some point I will. Mm. Let me see. Da, da, da. Why is everyone laughing at my comment over grass? I meant like normal. Yeah. You, know, you guys know what I mean? Like grass, like outside, okay? Because in the UK we have slang. That's why I was being very specific. Yeah, yeah. Grass in the garden. <laughs> well, hey, I don't I'd know. I could give those pipes another go. I'd have just for the uh, experimental love of experimental archaeology. I'd you know, to... there was a question actually. Someone did ask. I think it was Angelina. She was asking, "Do you do experimental archaeology?" I mean, I did when I was at university. We built a recreation of a Iron Age roundhouse, which was fun, mm, that's and quite cool. um, did maybe a little bit of a bronze casting and stuff. A little bit, maybe if I remember correctly. Um, but that is something I, I've thought about doing on the channel as well. I just don't know why. I sort of have this idea to do activities that a, someone living in the Paleolithic would have also done. Like, is there anything, because our lives are so different now, is, but is there anything in our lives that we would have done and a Paleolithic person could have done as well? Mm. I mean, there are a few things, but we'll see. <laughs> For our viewers, don't forget to hit that like button and actually comment in the video and not the live chat. That would be great. And hit that subscribe button if you're liking it. And even if you don't like it, just hit that subscribe button. You can like click off the notifications bell, even for Stefan's stuff as well. <laughs> yeah. We don't doing? mind. You've watched this far, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. One more question. Craig, nice to meet you. I'm hoping you're enjoying yourself. You have to go back to the beginning, though, because we're coming up towards the end of our discussion today. But thank you for joining us. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, I know a nice one. Your favorite archaeological site? Uh, that's a tough one. It is, I know. <laughs> one that was probably really... Um, I mean, I suppose there are two that really had an influence on me when I was a kid. Uh, in uh, Wales, there's a town, Car Leon, and they have a Roman amphitheater. And we went there on a school trip. And uh, I thought that was just incredible. And they had a, a proper, like, um, uh, accurate replica of the Roman lorica segmentata, the armor that they would wear. And they only had one and they asked for volunteers to put it on. And I almost dislocated my shoulder, like putting my hand up so much, like the classic kid, like me, it has to be me, please pick me. And uh, they picked this kid I went to school with, Leo O'Toole, and not me. And I'll never forgive you, Leo, wherever you are in your life now. We were, like, you, just, you remember his name, so it's definitely burned you, hasn't it? It's scarred well, you for life. He was a friend of mine, but he... Uh, he moved to America when he was 11, but now we both live in America. So I'm going to, I'm going to track you down, Leo. But uh, yeah, so that was just probably the best day ever of my childhood. But also I grew up in uh, Worcester in England, which played a pretty, I don't know if important role is the right word, but there was like the first and last battle of the English civil war happened at Worcester. So when you grow up there, all your history classes are about the English Civil War and all your school trips are about the English Civil War. And there's a church in Worcester where the soldiers sharpened their weapons before the battle. And so the church has all these grooves in it, in the sandstone um, from, you know, several thousand people doing that. And when I was a kid, I'd like rub my hands through those grooves because it was sort of a way that I could uh, touch history. And I would tell anyone walking past that church, like, oh, you see those lines? That was where the soldiers sharpened their weapons. You know, I would tell absolutely anyone that fact. And when I next go home, I'm going to make a video on it. So I'm going to tell the whole world that fact again for a second time. I think that'd be brilliant. Yeah. 
So yeah. that, those two had a big influence on me when I was a kid. So that's the thing. So in a way, like your your love your love affair with archaeology started from a very young age. I think most of us actually have kind of had that that stay in the game anyway. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is. Yeah. It just sort of caught my attention as a kid, and uh, you know now now I'm so fortunate to be able to make my living talking about it. So thanks to everyone who subscribes to my channel, supports me on Patreon. You're all a bunch of legends. And I'm going to uh, try and keep making good videos. Brilliant. I think stepping on that note, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Is there anything you'd like to add before we go? Uh, not really. Just watch all my videos. Don't skip the adverts. Subscribe. Hit the bell. <laughs> Send every spare penny you have to my Patreon account. No, I'm, I'm only joking. Just uh, watch, you know, if you haven't seen my channel before, watch a video, check it out, and uh, I hope it, I hope you enjoy it. That's it. Is it possible to say goodbye with your spoon? Just for our viewers yeah. at home, who are obviously now, just in case they're checking in. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button for future live streams as you know we go live every week with archaeologists all over the world so it's very um it's quite an unusual platform that we have on behind the trial we just interview anyone and everyone who's in the world of archaeology so that's great thank you all again have a lovely last few days of 2020 and i'll see you in 2021 see you guys bye <laughs>